In 1978, a 20-year-old pilot named Frederick Valentich radioed Melbourne, Australia traffic control that he was seeing green lights closing in on him. Shortly thereafter, radio communication was lost and Frederick and his plane were never seen again. Let's explore. Hi everyone and welcome to Project Blue Book, where we explore all things unidentified. I am Thor, and thanks for tuning in. It's easy to dismiss the disappearance of Frederick Valentich as intentional and self-inflicted, and that's what many did back in Tasmania, even as the official record of his disappearance was an engine failure. Even the Australian Aviation Authority report titles the incident as accident not an encounter, as Frederick himself desperately tried to communicate. If it weren't for the radio communication, he would join the ranks of other pilots and their airplanes lost at sea, Amelia Earhart, Malaysia Airline Flight MH370, to name a couple. Frederick had 150 hours of flying time, mostly inside the cockpit of a four-seater Cessna 182L, and with extra horsepower capacity a beautiful machine that is incredibly stable, redundant in instrumentation, and capable of gliding 1.5x the distance of its altitude. A successful and safe single-engine propeller airplane in every way imaginable. He was attempting a flight over the Bass Strait between mainland Australia and the city of Melbourne to the island of Tasmania, a 125-mile divide between Moorabbin and King Island. At 7.06 p.m. on the 21st of October, 1978, Valentich radioed the Melbourne Flight Service to report an unidentified aircraft following him at 4,500 feet altitude over sea level. He quickly got a reply there was no traffic in the area or anywhere near him at the time, but Valentich kept insisting he had visual contact with a large unknown craft he was unable to identify. It appeared to have four bright landing lights, he said, all illuminated. This began almost a five minutes of radio communication between Steve Robbie, an air traffic advisor, in 1978 a radio operator at the Melbourne Flight Control Center, and Valentich Cessna's call sign Delta Sierra Juliet. Based on transcript, it went something like this, call sign and control center address removed, beginning at 1906 hours. Valentich, Melbourne Flight Center, Delta Sierra Juliet. Is there any known traffic below 5,000 feet? Robbie, Delta Sierra Juliet, no known traffic. Valentich, I am, seems to be a large aircraft below 5,000. Robbie, what type of aircraft is it? Valentich, I cannot affirm it is Four bright, it seems to be like landing lights. Then there's pause. Valentich, the aircraft has just passed over me at least a thousand feet above. Robbie, Roger, and it is a large aircraft, confirm? Valentich, uh, unknown due to the speed it's traveling. Is there any Air Force aircraft in the vicinity? Robbie, no known aircraft in the vicinity. Valentich, it's approaching right now from due east towards me. Pause. It seems to me that he's playing some kind of game. He's flying over me two, three times at a speed I cannot identify. Robbie, what is your actual level? Valentich, four and a half thousand, four five zero zero. Robbie, and confirm you cannot identify aircraft? Valentich, affirmative. Robbie, roger that, stand by. Valentich, it's not an aircraft. Robbie, can you describe the aircraft? Valentich, as it's flying past, it's a long shape. Cannot identify more than pause, then continues. It's before me right now. Robbie, and how large would the object be? Valentich, 
it seems like it is stationary. What I'm doing right now is orbiting and the thing is just orbiting on top of me. It's got a green light and sort of a metallic, it's all shiny on the outside. It just vanished. Would you know what kind of aircraft I got? Is it military? Robbie. Confirm the aircraft just vanished. Valentich, say what? Robbie, is the aircraft still with you? Valentich, uh, now approaching from the southwest. The engine is rough, idling. I've got it set at 23, 24, and the thing is just coughing. Robbie, Roger, what are your intentions? Valentich, my intentions are to go to King Island. Ah, uh, Melbourne, that strange aircraft is hovering on top of me again. Pause. It is hovering. It is not an aircraft. Then the radio became static. Valentich's voice was lost and cannot be heard ever again. What Steve Robbie could hear was an ear-piercing metallic scraping sound, almost tearing his ears off. And then there was just silence for 17 seconds before radio contact was lost. This was the end of the transcript. Frederick Valentich was never heard of or seen again. The weather at the time was clear with a trace of stratocumulus clouds between 5,000 and 7,000 feet. Excellent visibility with light winds. Fuel on board was enough to last five hours of flight. Melbourne Flight Center assumed he had crashed, all but ignoring the statements just made by the lost pilot. An initial search over the strait, on boats and from the air, turned nothing up whatsoever. No wreckage, no fuel surfacing on the ocean, nothing. The weather was fine, the conditions for shirts were ideal. Remember 21st of October is springtime in Australia. Almost no time had lapsed and they knew exactly where to look. Yet the Australian Department of Transportation found nothing. Frederick Valentich and his Cessna were presumed lost and the report states it was an accident, engine failure, like he had said, and made no mention of the encounter with the craft that never showed up on radar. It's as if it conveniently never existed and had no connection or added no context to Frederick's disturbing distress radio call. The report mentions Frederick's certification for visual meteorological conditions, the US equivalent of visual flight rules. It further states where he was going, his filed flight plan, his intentions were known, and he had four life jackets on board because he had friends on King Island he wanted to take for a ride. The report further states that communication with Melbourne are open to interpretation, suggesting Frederick was disoriented and ultimately entered a tailspin or a spiral, both deadly conditions and disorienting, completely destroying the inner ears, sense of up and down, a highly strange sensation for those who have experienced it in extreme flight attitudes, where focus on instruments is paramount and afforded only those with proper training. The conclusion of the report was that Frederick Valentich lacked experience in assuming his reported engine trouble, he entered into a deadly spin from which he was unable to recover. To glide the plane to a successful emergency landing on King Island or the ocean surface. However, there are numerous police reports of witnesses on the coast in that exact area describing and claiming to having witnessed a UFO off the coast that Saturday night. According to a Royal Australian Air Force spokesman, about 10 reports of UFO sightings were logged during the same weekend of Frederick's disappearance. Steve Villages, a resident of Queensland, saw a long object hovering in the evening sky and he could clearly see four identifiable green lights which came from the craft's elongated underbelly. All ten reports described four flashing green lights associated with the UFO sightings. Five years after Valentitz went missing, an engine cowl flap washed ashore on nearby Flanders Island and the Australian Bureau of Traffic Safety issued a statement the part matched a Cessna 182L. 
Now, this story is super interesting to me for two reasons. It combines two elements of the UFO encounter and abduction phenomena that are equally baffling. First is the denial of the evidence by authorities, aviation in this case, by the media, and ultimately by the public, despite multiple corroborating independent evidence. Here, we have the record of the final conversation and Frederick's account of what he was experiencing, and we have eyewitness accounts describing the exact same craft from the shore. In absolute denial of data and facts, the report states, without doubt, it was an accident and that he lost control of the airplane into a death spiral due to engine failure. It's as if facts don't matter. And what matters most is to fit the fate of Frederick Valentich into an acceptable model, fabricated or not. Second, there's a bizarre appendix to this story, too unbelievable to be recited, but it serves as a model, just like the Philadelphia Experiment story does, and I have covered, to take facts, conflate them with hyperbole, theory, and speculation to create a parallel universe of events. In August 1982, two years later, a Russian lieutenant colonel, Igor Kazantsev, received a report of a man arrested near the then Soviet Chinese border dressed in a cowboy outfit, head to toe. The mystery man claimed to be Frederick Valentich, abducted and recruited by aliens from the Pleiades, a star system well known and recognized from prior cases. According to the Soviet lieutenant colonel, Valentich was now willingly flying cargo missions in and around Earth on behalf of the non-human intelligences. The danger here is that when we take fiction and conflate them with facts as if they stand on equal footing, we dilute the credibility of all information, data, accounts, and testimony associated with the factual event, the disappearance of Frederick Valentich. Such conflation of fact and fiction is hurtful to the cause and pursuit of truth regarding unexplained phenomena. It is only by traveling a road of disciplined adherence to facts, avoiding the distractions of denial and the fascination of speculative elaboration that we find our way to the actual truth. And we will. You can watch and listen to this and other podcasts on Project Blue Book, where we explore all things unidentified. Each day, let's practice compassion and kindness. And please subscribe. I am Thor, and thanks for tuning in. See you next time.